الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على رسول الكريم وعلى آله وصحبه ومن استنى بسنة لا يوم الدين All praise is due to Allah and may Allah's peace and blessings be on his last Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and on all those who follow the path of righteousness until the last day The topic of today's khutbah was the shahadatan or the declaration of faith the declaration of faith which states I bear witness that there is no God or no object of, wor- of worship worthy of worship besides Allah and I bear witness that Muhammad وسلم, is the messenger of Allah this declaration of faith forms the basis of Islam the foundation on which all of the other pillars of Islam depends. If this basis is not sound, then all of the rest of the acts of worship that a person may perform will be of no value. And to the degree that it is distorted, it is to that degree that the acts of worship have become devalued. The reality is that today most people or many people who consider themselves to be Muslims have only the shahadatan, this this declaration of faith. They have made this declaration and they feel that that is sufficient for them to guarantee them paradise and there is no need to do any other deeds beyond that. So you will find many Muslims in different parts of the world who will not be establishing prayer or fasting in Ramadan you know the various acts of worship though they know them they won't be doing so because they believe that when one declares one's faith that is sufficient to get one to paradise what has happened is that they have become deluded as the Christians are deluded in believing that once one accepts Jesus as being God who came to the earth and sacrificed himself for the sins of men that that guarantees one paradise the majority of Christians, the Protestants in the Pacific you know hold that that guarantees one's paradise just that belief however this concept of faith is one which is alien to Islam because when you look throughout the Quran whenever Allah speaks about belief you find that he always speaks about righteous deeds after stating belief he goes on to explain something of the righteous deeds which are immediately attached to that belief because faith without action is meaningless faith has to produce some change it has to produce some many it must have some manifestation in the actions of the individual otherwise that faith is just words what has happened is that people have mixed up the concept of knowledge and the concept of faith see because you may have knowledge about a thing but not have faith in it you may know that so and so is the case because that knowledge has come to you, you have knowledge about it but because you haven't really accepted it in your heart then you're not going to act on it when you have accepted it in your heart and you are prepared to act on it then that knowledge is translated into faith see this is the uh, this is the correct Islamic concept of faith when we say we believe that there is no God but Allah we're talking about not just words that are said but a concept which has been accepted in the heart which now will affect how we deal with our day to day lives how we deal with people, how we deal in society etc this is faith, true faith and in Islam faith has to be preceded by knowledge so it's not that we're saying you you negate this knowledge and you're just dealing with faith, no faith has to be preceded by knowledge because you have to know who Allah is so that you don't worship other than Him 
If you don't know who Allah is, if it's mixed up in your mind as to who God is, you know, then you can end up worshipping His creation and think you're worshipping God, like the Christians. You know, when you ask them, why are you worshipping Jesus? They say, well, we're not worshipping Jesus the man, we're worshipping God who became the man. So they're mixed up in their minds. They don't have knowledge of really who God is. And because of that, they can end up worshipping a man. Believing at the same time that they're worshipping God. Similarly, the Hindus. When you ask them, why are you worshipping this idol? You know, the knowledgeable amongst them will tell you, listen, we're not worshipping the idol itself, this object that we made by our own hands. We are worshipping God who is manifest in this idol. You see, so they have, again, deluded their, their concept of who God is. is distorted. And so it has led them to worshipping His creation. So in, from an Islamic perspective, one has to have knowledge of who God is. After understanding that, and what is required of us, then we commit ourselves emotionally to it <coughs> and the end result is what we call faith in the true sense knowledge followed by an emotional commitment to that knowledge to act on that knowledge when the emotional commitment precedes that knowledge then you may end up worshipping as I said anything believing at the same time that you are in fact worshipping Allah now when we look at the Shahadatan, the two declarations of faith, the first part, <coughs> bearing witness that there is no God but Allah, it consists of two parts in itself. One we say, La ilaha, that is, there is no God, and what do we mean by God? Whatever becomes an object of worship. Whatever we submit our wills to, this is the God. It could be our desires, an individual who just does whatever his desires tells him to, or his desires has become his God. It could be money, one who will do anything to get a hold of money, sell himself, sell his wife, his sister, whatever kill, cheat, steal, whatever for money then money has become his God so the God can be in many different forms doesn't necessarily have to be an object like we think in terms of worship you're praying to directly no because Allah does say in the Quran have you seen the one who takes his desires as his God and the Prophet Muhammad had said you know that the, the worshipper of the dirham that is of money will be wretched so, the first part of the declaration of faith, we negate that there exists in creation any object deserving of our worship, deserving that we be submitted to, that we become slaves of. And this includes cigarettes, smoking. We have talked before about the fact that smoking is prohibited, Islamically speaking, because of the fact that it is harmful to the body. It will kill you. The medical profession have shown it to be a direct cause of cancer. And on that basis it becomes haram for a Muslim to take something which you know will kill you because this is now an act of suicide. But from another point of view, a person who smokes, who becomes addicted to smoking, what has happened? He has lost his will. He can't give it up. He's so attached to the thing, it now controls him. He knows it's harmful. He reads on the package, it says, this will harm your health. But it has no effect on him. Because he has submitted his will to the cigarette. He has become a slave of the cigarette. This is one of the reasons why cigarette smoking is prohibited. Anything which will cause us to lose and give up our will to it, this is something that the Muslim has to avoid. The second part of that declaration is Illallah. 
that is, except Allah. We have denied that there is nothing in creation worthy of submitting ourselves to as slaves, submitting our wills to, except Allah. And when we say Allah, as I said before, we have to be clear on who is Allah. Allah is the creator of the universe who is one in the purest sense in the uniquest sense there is nothing similar to him in any way nothing of this creation has the attributes of Allah nor does Allah have the attributes of anything in this creation and he is the only one who answers our prayer. It is Allah alone who answers our prayer. Therefore, when we make this declaration, it implies certain things. If this declaration is true, then it implies certain things. One, primarily, that Allah is the only one who will worship. Because if He is the only one who answers our prayers, then He is the only one who should be worshipped. So if we believe He is the only one, then He is the only one who we will worship. And this is what is fundamental to worship in Islam. That worship is directed only to Allah. We have nothing between ourselves and Allah. There is no switchboard operators who we have to go through to get to Allah. We pray to Allah directly. Allah said, Ud'uni astajib lakum. Call on me and I will answer you. This is Allah's promise. So no one can carry our prayers to Allah for us. We pray directly to Allah alone. And this was what was understood by the pagans when the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu came to them and brought the concept La ilaha illallah they understood that this meant cancelling all of their gods, gods who were intermediaries, who they believed, as they said, لِيُقَرِّبُونَ إِلَى اللَّهِ زُلْفَةً who would bring us closer. These gods they believed were not Allah. They didn't think that the gods were Allah, but they believed that these gods would bring them closer to Allah. They were sort of means, like the saints of the Catholics, would bring them closer to Allah. But when the Prophet Muhammad came with this, you know, they said, أَجَعَلَ الْآلِئَهَ إِلَاهًا وَاحِدًا إِنَّ هَذَا لَشَيْءٌ عُجَابٌ Is he saying, that is Muhammad is he trying to make all the gods into one? You know, this is surely a strange, weird claim. They understood clearly that La ilaha illallah meant cancelling all other gods. So when we look around the Muslim world, and we see the proliferation of saints, people who are praying to individuals who they have designated as saints, being of a higher and purer status than the average human being, as is claimed. And truly, people are on different levels. There were individuals of the past, and there are individuals of the present, who are more righteous, who have avoided more sin, than the average person. But the fact that they have done so does not put them on any kind of level whereby they now have the ability to carry your prayers to Allah for you. No. This has not been designated by Allah. And what we find also is the proliferation of grave worship connected to the saints worship you go into the Muslim world and you find in many places every masjid will have a grave in it. In the courtyard outside of it or right inside of it. The grave of somebody who they have designated, people have designated over time as being a saint. And people will go to this grave and they will perform acts of worship in the grave. You go to Egypt, they have the grave of what they call Sayyidina Zainab. And uh, they do tawaf around the grave. You go there, you'll see people right now making tawaf, just like they make around the Kaaba 
you know, circumambulating the Kaaba, this is an act of worship, they are there making tawaf, going around this way. And you'll find Muslims slaughtering animals, you know, for the people in the grave, bringing food, you know, just like how the Hindus and the others will go to their idols, they bring food and place food there and stuff. You'll find Muslims doing this around the Muslim world. And how can they be doing this while believing that Allah is the only one who answers their prayers? What is the difference between their acts and the acts of the Hindus and the others? Virtually there is no difference. So this is telling us clearly that though people are claiming that they declare their faith, that in fact their practices have negated that faith. See, the fact that a person declares faith doesn't automatically mean that nothing can negate it. Truly, when you make that declaration of faith, you know, I bear witness that there is no God, no object of worship worthy of worship except Allah and that Muhammad is the messenger of Allah. This takes one into faith. Very simple. You know, there is no baptism and set of rites that you have to go through to become a Muslim. Very simple. You make that declaration, you are in Islam. But you start to worship a saint and you are back out again. You know, just as simply as you can come in, you can go out just as simply. So let us not be fooled. Those of us who were born in Muslim families and raised as Muslims practicing these acts, which in fact are classified according to Islam as shirk, polytheism, that we are in fact Muslims simply because our parents were Muslims or because we have claimed that we believe in Allah and the Messenger. <clears throat> and this declaration of faith requires us to establish prayer. <clears throat> because Allah talks about those who truly believe as those who repent and establish prayer. Such become our brothers in faith. If we believe that Allah is the one who answers our prayer, and we know as we live from day to day that there are so many things that we need and we want, then the only way to attain these things, ultimately, is to turn to Allah in prayer. It doesn't mean that we don't make any efforts on our part, of course. We have to strive. We have to make some effort to gain the things that we want of this life. The things that we want of the next life. However, it is Allah who ultimately gives our actions success. Allows them to come into fruition. It is He. So therefore we have to turn to Him in prayer. That comes automatically with the declaration of faith. So prayer cannot be separated from that declaration of faith. This is why everything else in, in Islam is built on that declaration of faith. Because they are all expressions of that declaration of faith. Similarly, zakah, paying compulsory charity, of 2.5% on the wealth that we have accumulated over a year. This is a part of that declaration of faith. And to show you that, we know after the time of the Prophet Muhammad Wasallam, when some people refused to pay zakah, the companions of the Prophet Muhammad Wasallam fought them. They took up arms against them, fought them to make them pay zakah, submit. And they insisted that there was no difference. One could not separate between salah and zakah. Interlinked. Because if we believe that Allah is the creator of all things, the wealth that we have, it was created by Him. It was given to us by Him. And He is the one who will reward us depending on how we use it, then are we going to resist giving of it 
what Allah has commanded us? Of course not. If we really believe that. We believe that when we take money from our money, though it may seem to decrease in quantity, when we give it according to the commandments of Allah, then it is increased in reward. What we have given is stored up in reward for us. And what we have remaining is blessed by Allah. If we believe that it is from Allah, then we must believe it. And if we believe that, then we must give zakah. And the Imam quoted a situation in which Hassan al-Basri, one of the scholars of the early generation, of Muslim scholars, was asked, you know, that people say that whoever says La ilaha illallah will enter paradise. Actually, the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu said that. Man qala la ilaha illallah dakhala al-jannah. Whoever says La ilaha illallah will enter paradise. But what does this mean? Does it mean that if we say La ilaha illallah and we worship idols or intermediaries, we disobey Allah all through our lives, rejecting all the principles of Islam, etc. We've said La ilaha illallah, we enter paradise. No. This is why in another statement of the Prophet Muhammad he did add a clarifying phrase. Man qala la ilaha illallah mukhlisan bi qalbi dakhal al-jannah. Whoever says la ilaha illallah sincerely from his heart enters paradise. So truly, if we say sincerely from the heart, meaning that it is real knowledge and commitment which naturally must be manifest in our actions. This is why Hassan al-Basri when he was asked this question he, he said to people that yes, whoever says la ilaha illallah but then applies what la ilaha illallah implies. Whatever is understood whatever follows from la ilaha illallah they apply it, they do it. Yes, they will enter paradise. And another person was asked of the early scholars, isn't La ilaha illallah the key to paradise? And he said, yes, but every key has teeth. You know, the key, it has these little points which make the key operate. So if you come with a key and no teeth, well, you're not going to be able to open the door. So that's like the teeth are like the application of the meaning of La ilaha illallah. So if you're not applying it, you have a key without teeth. It won't open the door. So, it is essential for us as Muslims to keep in mind that our declaration of faith is not a set of words that we parrot five times a day in each of our prayers we go through in the section of the prayer called the Tashahud where we make that declaration of faith we renew it at the end of our wudu the Prophet Muhammad taught us that at the end of wudu we should make the declaration of faith so we're doing it numerous times. That this is not a set of words which we just parrot. Just repeat from our lips. Like a parrot. But a commandment to action based on knowledge and true faith. The second part of the declaration of faith I bear witness that Muhammad is the messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam this is accepting Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam as being the messenger of Allah as all the people before us were required to bear witness 
that the messengers who were sent to them were the messengers of Allah. Whether it was Isa, Jesus, Moses, Abraham, David, whoever of the prophets, those who we know and those who we don't know, who were sent to all of mankind, they all came with a declaration of faith which had two parts to it. The first part which we talked about, accepting Allah as the one true God, deserving of worship, etc. And the other part, accepting them as being the messenger of Allah. Why was that necessary? It was necessary because the message was demonstrated by the messengers. Allah sent messengers to show people how to apply La ilaha illallah. The declaration of faith in Allah had to be applied as we said. But how to apply it correctly? If it's left up to the human being, he can end up worshipping as we said before, trees, animals, people, etc, etc. So it was the job of the messenger to show the application of La ilaha illallah in human life. And this is how we would understand, for example, the statement which is commonly quoted by Christians, you know, when you try to explain to them that Jesus was a messenger of Allah and they want to insist, no, He was God and we should worship Him or through Him. They will say that Jesus said, I am the light and the way. No one comes to the Father except by me. They commonly quote this. However, what we would say is that if Jesus in fact did say this, this was said by all of the prophets. Allah even tells Prophet Muhammad, may Allah's peace and blessing be upon him, to say to the people, Hadihi Sabili, this is my way. This is the way to Allah. If we follow that path, we will be truly submitting to Allah. If we do not, then we will disperse following the paths of Satan. So the only way to Allah, to God, was the way which the prophets brought. So all of the prophets commanded the people to follow their way. And that's what we would understand from that statement of Jesus, if in fact he did say it. Not that he was saying to worship me, but to go my way, the way of the prophets. And this declaration of faith in relationship to the Prophet Muhammad it means that we will obey whatever he has commanded us. Allah says in the Quran, "May you to Rasul, Fakad Ata Allah." Whoever obeys the messenger has obeyed Allah. This is why we obey him. Not because he was divine or semi-divine. No, he was a human being like any one of us. In the sense that we are human beings. But, he was a righteous human being who received revelation from Allah. And that's what makes him in a different category. The, re the reception of revelation. So that what he said was in fact revelation from Allah. As Allah said, وَمَا يَنْتِقُوا عَنِ الْهَوَىٰ إِنْ هُوَ إِلَّا وَحْشٍ يُحَىٰ What he speaks is not from his own desires. It is revelation which he has received from Allah. So that's why we obey him. That's why we must obey him. That's what that sh the shahada section of the shahada, the declaration of faith means. That we will obey him in whatever he commands us. Because what He is commanding us is from Allah. That was the purpose of the miracles that were given to the prophets. To demonstrate to the people. All of the prophets received miracles. Miracles which were specific 
to the people of their time, which demonstrated to the people that those individuals were in fact prophets of Allah. It wasn't to show people or to confuse people into thinking that they were Allah, no. That's why when Jesus made the dead come to life, or the lame walk, or the blind see, He would always let the people know that this was by the will of Allah. Not by His will, but by the will of Allah. This was just to demonstrate, to show people. Otherwise people would, you know, there are always people claiming prophethood, claiming that they're from Allah or whatever. You have a lot of people claiming the right that they should be followed. So how do we know? When somebody comes with evidence, the miracle, then that is clear evidence for us that this person is in fact sent by Allah. And what you found is that the various miracles which are given to the prophets, they were in accordance with the areas in which the people to whom they were sent excelled. Like Prophet Moses was sent to the Egyptians. The Egyptians were known for magic. The magician amongst them was amongst the highest in the strata of the society. They became almost objects of worship next to the Pharaoh. So Allah gave him miracles which were similar to what the people were doing, but on another class in itself. This is why Allah says in the Qur'an, that when the magicians threw their staffs down and they turned into snakes, and Moses threw his staff down and it turned into a snake, and it ate the snakes of the others. For the people standing back, this was evidence that what Moses had was stronger, was greater than what these magicians had. But for the magicians, it was evident that he was a messenger of Allah. So they all fell down in prostration. Because they knew that what they were doing was illusion. It was only made to seem to the people that these staffs that they threw on the ground were in fact snakes. But they didn't change into snakes, really. Whereas in the case of Musa, alayhi salam, what he threw down became a snake. And they knew this is beyond their power. They're not able to cause a change in nature, only they were able to delude people into thinking it took place. Whereas Musa's staff became a snake. So they knew this was not the work of a man. So they submitted. Similarly, Prophet Isa was sent to the Jews. The Jews were noted for medicine. To this day, the leading doctors in the various fields, large numbers of them are Jews. They specialize in these fields. Medicine, on a world scale, is a very key field. Because if you are the surgeon, then it means the president is likely to have to come under your hand. You see, if your numbers are few and you want to be able to control a society, and you control the medical profession, it means those people who are against you can eliminate. You're in that key position. So they are specialized in medicine. Their numbers are far out of proportion to the proportion that they represent in the American society. And historically, they have been specialists in medicine. They would take a person who broke his knee and fix a splint or whatever. A person who got sicknesses of the eye, they would, you know, get some medicines, herbs, whatever, and help to cure these sicknesses. A person who got so sick, they were almost about to die, they would prepare medicines which helped them seemingly to remain alive. But what Allah gave Prophet Jesus was that He made a person who was born lame, not a person who broke his leg, but one who was born with a crooked foot. He made him able to walk, this is something the doctors couldn't do. He made the one who was born blind. Not the one whose sight was going from sicknesses, but he was born without sight, made him see. And then he didn't catch the one who was just getting sick, who was appearing to die, but the one who was dead. Everybody said he's dead. He made him come back to life. So the miracles that he was given was beyond the abilities of the doctors to show to the people that he was in fact a messenger of Allah. And of course we believe in miracles which even the Christians don't know about. That Jesus, for example, spoke 
as a newborn baby in the cradle. This is miracles, yeah? And that not only did he bring the dead back to life, but that he took clay, molded it into the shape of a bird, blew on it, and it flew away, a living bird. But the thing is, he said, by the will of Allah. But this was to demonstrate to the people. Similarly, Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu there were miracles which took place in his time. We know of the splitting of the moon in Mecca. As a sign to the people, Allah caused the moon to split before their eyes. One falling to one side, one half falling to the other, one, one half falling to the other side. To demonstrate to them. But of course, you know, people have always, those who refuse, even what their eyes tell them, you know, what their hearts know to be true, because they don't want to submit, they don't want to follow, they'll find some excuse. They say, oh, he's a magician. That's what he is, magician. Well, of course, and there were many other miracles also that Prophet Muhammad performed, <coughs> confirming for his, his followers and for the people around him that he was a Prophet of Allah. But he had, because of the fact that he was the last of the Prophets, there were none to come after him, he also had a miracle which would not only show the people in his time that he was a Prophet of Allah, but which would remain for people for all time. So that we in this time can see that miracle. Because if we are asked to believe in the miracle of the splitting of the moon of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu or the bringing to life of the dead of Prophet Isa, or the turning of the staff into a snake for Prophet Musa and the miracles of the other prophets, if we were to believe in that, if we are asked to believe in it, it's kind of hard. We didn't see it. For us it's like hearsay. So, a miracle was left which would stand until the end of time for people to see with their own eyes to be able to comprehend that Muhammad وسلم, was a messenger of Allah and that is the Quran the Quran which is a miracle in itself a literary miracle a miracle which could not be imitated the challenge is there in the Quran Allah says if you do not believe that this is from Allah then produce one chapter like it smallest chapter in the Quran is al kawthar four verses three verses actually. in English when we read it if we read that challenge and we read it in English we would say surely we could find Shakespeare who could make a better three verses than these I mean they're pretty good Yusuf Ali's three are pretty good but Shakespeare or Chaucer or you know some of the famous English poets I'm sure they could do better than this so where is the miracle? the miracle is not in the English as Allah said, He revealed an Arabic Qur'an, an Arabic reading. That's the Qur'an, the miracle lies in the Arabic. And this is why we as Muslims are strongly advised, strongly encouraged, not only to learn enough Arabic to say our prayers, but to learn Arabic so that we can taste the miracle of the Qur'an. We can feel the words of Allah as they were revealed. Because this challenge which was in Arabic was presented before the pagan Arabs. And they had every reason to meet this challenge because you have different kinds of challenges. You may have a challenge which, for example, is a nonsense challenge. If I stood here and said, I'm greater than President Bush and I dare President Bush to prove it. Well, this is a nonsense challenge. President Bush, if he heard that Bilal Phillips in Saudi Arabia, Riyadh, said that he's greater than him, he's not going to go out of his way to prove that he is greater than I am. No. It's nonsense. Who am I? So such a claim is a meaningless claim. No need to prove it. Now the claim of the Quran was one where there was need to prove it. Because what the Qur'an was calling to was a threat to the existence of Meccan society as it was. Mecca had become not only the religious center of Arabia, because the Arabs had all brought their idols there and they were all around the Kaaba, the house of worship built by Prophet Abraham, surrounded by idols, over 360 out of them were there to become the center of worship of 
idolatry for Arabia. So Arab tribes used to come there on pilgrimage. So in coming on pilgrimage, they would bring goods with them to trade, etc. So the Arabs of Mecca had become the middlemen of trade in Arabia. And they had become economically, you know, very well off, very comfortable. They were rich. So when you're talking about destroying all the idols, what are you talking about? Threatening their economics. And when you threaten a man's economics, he's ready now to fight. And that's what happened. The pagans of Mecca, they wanted to stop the Prophet Muhammad at all costs. They tried everything. They offered him money. They said, listen, if it's money you want, we'll all collect some of our money and make you the richest man in Mecca. If it's women, we will take our most beautiful women and give them to you. Because then they had polygamy without any restrictions. You could have a hundred wives if you want, right? Just please give this up. Stop. Stop saying this. We don't mean, we're not even saying you don't have to give it up in terms of your own personal belief, but just stop telling people about it. You refuse. They tried to boycott him. For a couple of years, they boycotted him and his whole family, trying to starve them to death. It failed. The only thing that was left, they said, okay, listen, this is it now. We all have to get together, we make a plan, we get young men from each of our tribes, they get together, they get to his house, and they kill him in his bed. Everybody doing it at the same time, so that no one tribe would be blamed, because in Arabia, you know, the tribal warfare, you know, something which would go on for generations. You do something against my tribe, my tribe will not rest until they get back at you. And it will go on for generation to generation to generation. And the tribe of the Prophet was a fairly powerful tribe. So they didn't, none of the other tribes wanted to you know, create that kind of problem from themselves as individuals. But they figured if we all do it together, we send young men from each of our tribes, and they all take part in killing him, then Banu Hashim, the tribe of Hashim, would not be able to take on all of us. So they just have to accept it. So they made the plan. But Allah had Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi leave. Went to Medina. But they weren't satisfied. It's not enough that they sent him that he left Mecca. They still had to go to get him. They, had to, they got their armies together to go to Medina to try to kill him in Medina. They wanted him to stop. Finish him off. Now, in doing all this and all the battles, they lost a lot of lives. If all they had to do was to produce three verses, and that would prove that he wasn't a prophet of Allah, that the Quran was just a fake, you think that they're going to give that up and do all these other things? Of course not. It's much easier to do that. And don't doubt that they didn't try. Of course. But they couldn't do it. And because of that, they used to tell the others in Mecca, if you hear Muhammad, وسلم, or any of his followers reciting the Quran, stick your fingers in your ears. They're magicians. That Quran is, you know, how they cast a spell over you. So that's what they would do. To avoid being enchanted by the Quran. And they loved, I mean, the poetry and prose, they loved it. I mean, they, they loved it to the point that they worshipped it. They had contests in the area of Taif and other parts where they would bring people from all over the country who would recite the poetry and their prose and they compete with each other. And, and the ones which were the greatest... The seven best ones historically, they loved them so much they wrote them in gold and they hung them on the wall of the Kaaba. Became objects of worship. They loved it. So they had a high sense of, of appreciation. Those people tend to think of the Arabs as being like wild, you know, just desert folk, you know. But at the same time, they had developed a very high level of, of language and language appreciation, of eloquence. And when they heard the Qur'an, I mean, they knew what eloquence was. They knew this was beyond anything that they could do. A high level of, of language and language appreciation, of eloquence. And when they heard the Qur'an, I mean, they knew what eloquence was. They knew this was beyond anything that they could do. 
So what was left for them, as I said, was to say that he's a magician. Don't listen to it. I was, but this was the miracle which would stand until the day of judgment. That anybody you read, Arbery, for example, Arbery, a, an Orientalist, non-Muslim, he translated the Quran. You read the introduction. You read what he has to say about the Quran. As a non-Muslim who mastered Arabic, translated it into English. His praise of the Quran, you would say this man must be a Muslim. He must be. Maybe he was hiding it. Because you have people in the West, you know, for fear of their positions, etc., you know, have accepted Islam, but have kept it quiet. But the point is that when you read it, you see the effect that it had on him. He talked about the symphony that he heard, the beauty that touched him to the deepest, you know, core of his heart. How when he was down in time, he had problems, you know, he had problems with his work or whatever. He would go and recite the Quran, read the Quran. Like this would change his whole mood and, you know, have this almost magical effect on him. So the non-Muslim writing. This is the Qur'an. This is that miracle which will stand. Of course, Allah has also put in the Qur'an certain other things. What we now look at as the scientific miracles of the Qur'an. Where Allah has talked about things 1,400 years ago, which nobody could perceive. It is not until these times when we have developed microscopes and telescopes, etc., etc., and we are able to understand what these verses are saying. This is there for those of us who cannot read Arabic at least that miraculous aspect of the Quran is still there for those who can't read Arabic but can honestly come to the Quran and see the presence of God in the Quran so that miracle of Prophet Muhammad is for us to require us as evidence for us that he was a messenger of Allah and as such we are obliged to obey him in whatever he has commanded us to do and whatever he has prohibited us from doing because we believe he was a messenger of Allah and what Allah has commanded is what is good for us and what he has prohibited is what is harmful for us but we are also required by our declaration of faith to believe whatever he has informed us of the future the prophecies, whatever he has informed us of the past. Because he didn't make this stuff up. This was revealed to him by Allah. Of course, for many of us who follow the prophecies, we read in the collections of the sayings of the Prophet Muhammad which we call the Hadith. There are many things which he spoke of, which we have seen come to light in our own time. And there are many more things he has spoken of, which are yet to come. And finally, this declaration of faith also means that we will not attempt to worship Allah in any way which He did not do. We will not attempt to worship Allah in any way which He didn't do. Allah sent Him as the guide. The things which will bring us closer to Allah because anytime you do something believing that it is pleasing to Allah or that it will bring us closer to Allah this thing that you are doing is an act of worship. And the Prophet Muhammad had said مَا تَرَكْتُ شَيْئًا يُقَرِّبُكُمْ إِلَى اللَّهِ إِلَّا وَأَمَرْتُكُمْ بِهِ I have not left anything which will bring you closer to Allah without commanding you to do it that's it so if somebody comes to you and says let us celebrate the birthday of the Prophet Muhammad we ask that person did the Prophet Muhammad celebrate his birthday he says no did he tell people to celebrate his birthday he said no did his companions celebrate his birthday he said no then why are we celebrating his birthday? Well, because, you know, uh, it's nice, you know, it's something pleasing to Allah. It's good. Remember the Prophet. 
We say, but if it was something which was pleasing to Allah, then Prophet Muhammad would have been the first to tell us to do it. And his companions would have been the first to do it. So obviously, though we might imagine that it is pleasing to Allah, it isn't. In fact, it is something displeasing to Allah. And of course, when we go around the Muslim world, we find Muslims celebrating the Prophet's birthday. Celebrating it to the point where they have parties, where they're playing music and dancing and singing songs and even drinking alcohol. Taking drugs in the celebration of the Prophet's birthday. You know, like Christmas. Like Christmas for the Christians who celebrate the birthday of, supposed birthday of Jesus, where they're doing all these things you find Muslims doing the same thing. And surely, by disobeying the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu doing what he did not command us to do, we will deviate. And that's clear evidence of that deviation. And I know, many of you here are from Philippines, you know, in the Philippines, it has been declared a national holiday. Right? <laughs> Yawm nabi Day of the Prophet. Muslims fought hard that the government would give them this day. Since the Christians have Christmas, we should have a day too. <laughs> Very unfortunate. Because it is not our job to compete with the Christians. Tits for tat. They have one, we should have one. No, it's not our job. We have a way which was brought by the Messenger of Allah. And that's what we follow. It doesn't matter if others are doing this or others are doing that. We don't try to follow the way because Prophet Muhammad prophesied. You will follow the way of the people before you, the Christians and the Jews. Step by step, inch by inch. So much so that if they went into a lizard hole, a lizard digs his hole in the ground and hides in it. That if they went in that hole, you're going to be crawling in after them. He prophesied this. And this is what we see come to pass. So many Muslims around the world the difference between what they're doing and what the pagans are doing, very, very little difference. Only they call themselves Muslims, the other ones call themselves Hindu or whatever. You look at a, a, a musibah or, or a tragic calamity which has befallen much of the Muslim world, especially in, in the area of Indo-Pakistan, Sri Lanka and these type of places, where the Hindu practice is that if you want to marry a woman, the woman's family has to give you wealth, give you a house and a car and money and everything. This is the dowry for them. This is their practice. And because families will promise and sometimes they're not able to fulfill the promises. Every year in India you have hundreds and hundreds of women who are set on fire by their, this, their in-laws. They call bride burnings. This is a phenomenon in India. Because the husband and the in-laws are upset because she didn't bring the stuff that they promised from their family so they set them on fire, throw gasoline on them and light them up. Guess what? The Muslims of India also, when they get married, the father of the bride, the women, they have to provide. And the men who are going to get married, they're demanding. Money, car, house, etc. So now you see, you hear our Muslim brothers from this part of the world. The brother will be crying. He said, I got six sisters. My father is dead. He has to work the rest of his life to try and get his sisters married. I met brothers. Gray hair, you know, the guy is almost in the grave. He still hasn't got married. He still tries to pay off for his sisters to get married. Terrible. You know, this is a calamity which has befallen us. And the result of this also is that when a man has a daughter, he's upset. The problem. He don't want any daughters. You know? he's, he's upset with his wife. If you've got a girl, what do you do that for? We don't need any. And what will happen is he has a daughter, he has a son. You know, he will, he will look after his son much better than his daughter. Because the daughter is a problem. You know, and this 
is really something. Because it's like going back to pre-Islamic times. When the Arabs, truly, they didn't like daughters either. They used to kill the daughters. So we see, any time we deviate from the path and we follow the paths of those pagans who live around us, then it ends up being a calamity for us in the end. And we have statements of the early scholars like Malik ibn Anas who was the or is, to whom the Maliki school of Islamic jurisprudence is attributed to he had said sitting in Medina in the masjid of the Prophet Muhammad Sallam, next to which was the tomb of the Prophet Muhammad Sallam, where he was buried and he said all of us referring to himself and all of the other scholars of his time we commit errors we're capable of committing errors and we do commit them except the one who is buried in that grave referring to Prophet Muhammad in that he was protected by Allah from errors which would mislead the community not that he never made any errors because he did he made errors of judgment and Allah corrected those errors so his errors became education to the ummah he didn't leave the Prophet Muhammad to make a mistake and his mistakes were not the kind of mistakes of course where we think of errors where you're becoming sinful you're disobeying Allah no his mistakes were choosing good when there was better you understand not that he was choosing evil over good we have to be clear on that too, right? But choosing something which he thought to be good, but really another choice was a better choice. So Allah would correct him that no, this one that you made was not the better choice. It was really that choice. As a prophet. And we also have the statements of a Shafi'i, the one to whom the Shafi'i school of Islamic jurisprudence is attributed. You know, in which he said that it was... A, agreed upon by all the scholars of his time that if one heard an authentic tradition of the Prophet Muhammad that to leave that and follow somebody's opinion this was major deviation this was stepping outside the bounds of Islam the words of the Prophet had to be given precedence over any human, the words of any human being and Imam Ahmed made similar statements he said you know he was very surprised that people would be told about the statements of Allah and they would be going to check the opinion of Sufyan al or you know the other scholars of the time you know what's your opinion what's your opinion but Allah said this clearly this, is, this brings to mind the issue of interest right you know where Allah says in the Quran that it is prohibited Whoever insists on dealing in it is cursed by Allah. He, he and his prophet have declared war against such a person. That when this command has reached us, we are to give up what remains to us of interest. Take our principle, what we invested, which was originally ours, take it out and leave the rest. But you have people today who will tell you, Fatwas, rulings have been made that if you have money in the bank and you take your money out and there is interest remaining, it's better you take this interest out and you give it to poor people or use it to, to build latrines for the mosque or something. Don't leave it because if you leave it behind, this bank will take it and donate it to the Christian organizations that are trying to spread missionary work into your countries and see all these lines of human reasoning and of course this is pleasing to people the idea that you have extra money there you take it out you don't leave it you find people with these opinions right? people who go and take these opinions when it's clear in the Quran I mean in no uncertain words Allah says leave what remains to you of interest leave it you're going to leave Allah's words and go to the opinions of these people what are you looking for? 
he's seeking destruction. You know, Allah said, فَلْيَحْذَرِ الَّذِينَ يُخَالِفُونَ عَنْ عَمْرِي Those who contradict the commandment of the Prophet of Allah should beware that a calamity will befall them or they will end up in hell. So we have to be very careful because truly, if you look hard enough you will find somebody who will give you a ruling which is pleasing to you. This is why the scholars are unanimous in prohibiting us from following concessions. In other words, you go from one school of thought, from one scholar to one scholar, you're looking for uh, you know, a support for what you want to do. In other words, you're not going into to a, an issue, you're going to research a problem, you want to find a solution, right? You're not going in to find the truth, you have already what you want to do. Are you going looking for somebody who will say you can do it? This is not accepted. Because yes, you can find people who made fatwa that says it's okay for a woman to wear a mini skirt as long as she wears dark stockings underneath. Yes? You'll find some people who will be called Sheikh so and so. You made this thing. Whatever you're looking for, you will find somebody. So it is about seeking the truth, looking for what the Prophet Muhammad said, what Allah said, and how this was explained by the early generations of Islam, whom the Prophet declared to be the best of generations. And Abu Hanifa was also reported to have said, if, an, if you find an authentic hadith, this is really my opinion. This is the way that I want it to go. In other words, he knew it wasn't possible for him to, to find all of the authentic hadith of his time because scholars were widespread. Sahaba had gone to different parts of the companions of the Prophet Muhammad Sallam had gone to different parts of the Ummah and had carried with them statements of the Prophet and it was not possible for one in, in, in a limited area in those times to gather all of these to come to the complete and correct position. So they made the best of what was available to them knowing full well that there could be other more correct uh, statements of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu elsewhere. So they let the people know that really what they did was based on their own limited knowledge. And that really in fact whenever we find something which is in fact the authentic statement of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, then that is what we should actually follow. So all that calls us to recognize in the second part of the Declaration of Faith that Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is the one who we follow blindly the only human being whom we are obliged to follow blindly everybody else we question so and so said to us we say what is your evidence for this please brother you know not that we are going to be disrespectful to say who are you to say this no we accept we are not any one of us the source of all knowledge we can always learn something new so we have to be open to hear from our brothers from the scholars, especially among them who, are, who have gathered, who spent their life and spent time and effort to gather this knowledge to convey it to us, we have to depend on them. But we do not depend on them blindly. We look to see and we ask them for the evidence for what they are saying. So we are following them based on knowledge to the degree that our limited knowledge is able to understand. But for Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu he said, don't do, we don't do. He said, do, we do. We don't question. We may seek to understand the wisdom in it, etc. But this, this not, the finding of that wisdom does not become a factor of whether we follow or we don't. No, we follow. If we find the wisdom, alhamdulillah, great. This improves our understanding to help us to understand it better, to, to be you know, behind it more actively, more committed to it. But we don't stop until we find out, no. He said, if a, a fly falls in any of your drink, drink it some milk, fly falls in it, duck it in, and then throw it out. Because under one wing is poison, sickness, and under the other wing is its cure. Now we know flies, flies are carrying disease. You know, if fly falls in your drink, you want to throw away the drink. Right? But we believe that what the Prophet Muhammad has told us is true. 
though we may not have found at this point in time where is the antidote in the fly for the sicknesses which the fly carries we believe that what he said is true and so we follow him what he has advised us of course it doesn't mean if you throw away the milk that you have now left Islam I just want to clarify that for those of you that are not ready to deal with this point right it doesn't mean you have left Islam if you did it right but one of a stronger faith a sign of stronger faith is that one is prepared to comply to follow the guidance and advice of the Prophet Muhammad believing because ultimately you see two people do the same thing and one gets an effect from it and another one doesn't this is the example you have though we know the medical science has told us smoking cigarettes produces cancer yet you will find they had an article about one woman in China who was 100 and 20 years old or 115 years old and they asked her what is the secret of your you know good health she said I smoke a cigar every day <laughs> I've been doing it from the time I was 12 you know so I you say wait you know, you know, this stuff is supposed to produce cancer she's supposed to be dead last time ago but here she is healthy you know 150 years old smoking her, her, her cigar every day well this is the greatness of Allah that though we see a cause and effect happening here and this is the case for most people if Allah doesn't wish you to get cancer no matter what you do you're not going to get it ultimately but we are obliged in this life to act according to cause and effect if the evidence from cause and effect shows that most people when they take this they die then we are supposed to assume that this will kill and we act according to that but we recognize ultimately that it is with Allah whether you die or you live so we follow Prophet Muhammad in whatever he has commanded us we do not worship except in the ways that he has taught us and we believe whatever he has informed us of the past or the future because it all came from Allah So, in summary, the basis of our faith is that declaration of faith. That there is no object of worth of worship worthy of our worship besides Allah, the one true God, who is the one alone who answers our prayers. And as such, He is the only one to whom we should pray and submit our wills totally and we also bear witness that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam was the last messenger of Allah none to come after him what he brought was from Allah and we are obliged to follow his way because the only way to Allah to submit ourselves in such a way which is pleasing to Allah which will earn us paradise is the way which he brought and we have to not only understand that theoretically but we have to take it to our heart and act on it act in accordance with it so when we see a person who says this or we are people who say it our actions reflect it non-muslims disbelievers will ask why are you doing this you're doing it because of your submission to Allah you become by submitting to Allah to the messenger of Allah you become a beacon of light in a world of darkness you believe that and you follow that light which is from Allah is there any comments any of you would like to make on the topic on the khutbah anything concerning the declaration of faith which perhaps I might have left out
or questions you'd like to raise, please. Thank you very much. One conclusion that I derive from the uh, topic is that we need knowledge. And not only knowledge, not only of knowledge of the one of life, but knowledge of Islam in its entirety. Uh, it's not very surprising to see that people, either in the Philippines or in the Indian subcontinent, commit shares because they do not know. Maybe the kind of knowledge that they have came from the people who claim to be ulama, but basically they've got their own knowledge of the Quran and the Sunnah. This is one part. The other part is that there are cases where the Muslims know exactly, in no uncertain terms, what the Quranic injunction are, what the Quranic legislation are. But unfortunately, to some extent, they compromise. For example, if we talk about smoking, or say interest These are very basic two issues that the Muslims are basically practicing. In the case of say alcohol, you find that if an Islamic state says that alcohol is absolutely prohibited, people may not be able to practice it because alcohol is not there. But in a case where we tell people that smoking is absolutely prohibited but you see cigarettes coming in and out. When we say that people should start using or rather uh, practicing into this place, but you see the banks all around, anywhere in, the, in, all, in all corners of the Muslim world. So I think it's not really surprising why we have all these kinds of calamities flagging us. We see that in fact we are not able to implement the concept of Shahadatani, as you say. It is not just Dictating or rather witnessing, because when we witness, it requires that we know or we see. And people might be asked, Have we seen God? In fact, some of the people may ask us, When you say that, Ashib Allah, Ilaha illallah, Ashib Allah, who is this God that you are thinking about? Have you seen him? Of course, it means that we know. When we declare we know the attributes of God, we know that uh, the Quran is based on that. We know the we know we are supposed to know the hadith and the Quran. But if Muslims will be asked how much of the Quran do we know? How much of the hadith we know? And how much of these things that we know that we implement? So we go back to the two questions that I posed about smoking and about internet life, for example. How do we be able to stop this? From the point of view of the all of us, what kind of role they should play for us to be able to stop this? Two things. Well, you know, brother, I mean, we have something which has to do with society, the implementation of Islam on a societal level, where Muslims or Muslim scholars may not be in a position to determine the, how Islam is implemented. Then what happens is politics comes into play and politics is based on economics what a society or, or country conceives to be in their own economic interest they will do even though the leading scholars of that country may say it is prohibited you follow? so that kind of a change on a societal level will not take place until the scholars are given their just due in that society to uh, guide the society to what is right and what is wrong but if the scholars are limited, they allow them to speak, but not, are not obliged to follow what they teach or what they advise, then, you see, we have a situation of, of weakness. We don't have a truly Islamic situation where the law, Islamic law, is being implemented as it should. So, that's one level. And it's the duty of the scholars to call to the truth. And they will have to inform us. They should not compromise with the uh, government, if the government is, say, controlled by, you know, Europe or America or whatever, you know, and is following on Islamic laws, etc., the, the scholars should not compromise in the sense of making halal what the government considers to be halal and what, making haram what they consider to be haram. No, they should not do that. If they've done that, they've sinned. They become the enemies of Islam, one of some of the greatest enemies, and among the first who will be thrown into hell, because they have such an effect. When they do wrong, their effect on the people is much greater than when you as an individual does wrong. So, of course, they have to stand firm to what is correct. 
But at the same time, we realize the reality of what we're living in today is that we are hard pressed to find a place where the government is committed to the point where the scholars, the Muslim scholars of the society have a direct role to play in the economic, you know, political and social uh, sphere, all of these spheres in the society. So it is something we, we have to recognize and we have to work towards to the degree that we're able. But ultimately, Islam comes back down to the individual. That I don't say, well because the government in the Philippines trades and sells cigarettes, or in Saudi Arabia, or in Egypt, that I am justified in using cigarettes. No. I mean, I am obliged to know is this halal or haram? If it is declared to be haram by the leading scholars, etc., then I know it's haram for me. There is no excuse. Unless I'm in a situation where I have no choice. It's a matter of life and death. For example, I may maybe find myself in an interest situation where the only means that I can get to put a roof over my head is to get a mortgage for a home. And I have to have a roof over my head, otherwise I'll die in the street. So I'm forced by that circumstance to deal to that degree in interest that is another circumstance which Islam takes into account where people are forced by circumstances for the, to protect themselves and their families. They may be forced to do some of the things which we normally classify as haram. But under the general circumstances, we, that's the, that's the beauty of Islam, that Islam is not something which we hold in our books, on our, on our shelves, in theory that we debate and discuss about until such time as the perfect Islamic state comes into being. No. It begins with us. Whatever we can find of Islam, we seek it and we try to apply it. We don't wait until the circumstances become perfect. Because surely, any effort of men is going to be imperfect. It's going to have weakness. And so what we try to do is to implement Islam to the best degree as we can within our own life. Encourage others to, to follow the precepts of Islam and to try to change the environment around us where we can, when we can. It's a good idea for men to have more than one wife. So why are women not getting the same you know, rights? So, you know, I try to, you know, the topic is the period of our fifteen years, is it enough, you know, to do justice for this topic? So I told him, uh, we shall continue on that thing. So I'm thinking of what he said in school, and in fact, I, I don't think I can convince him because he seems to be, you know, um, that's to whatever I do. Whatever he's telling me, he says, okay, he has a different way of trying to do so I don't know what contribution you have to give me so that more I try to do something Well, uh, we could say that, um, you know, if we're looking at, because we're talking now in terms of logic, right? We can't tell him, well, in the Quran it says only for men, for wives, it doesn't say for women. Because it's not convincing, right? I mean, we're trying to give some kind of logical reasons why uh, this is for men and not in the case of women. And one would have to look to see first. Why is it that it's permitted for men in the first place? And why is it okay for men? And we see that the number of women in the world, in general, from mo most countries that you go to, the women outnumber the men. And this is not something which is, you know, you, you can't understand why. I mean, you can go and look at the factors. There are biological reasons why. Women outlive men. This is God's destiny. God destined that the average age of women in North America is like 80. The average age of men is like 72 or 73. You know? You go and look in, uh, around the world, women, people who are over 100, like 75% of them are women. This is the destiny of God. That women outlive men. And also, we see in society... The crimes that are committed, people are being murdered all around the world. Who? 
When we read about people who get their heads chopped off here each year for murder, how many women do we read about? Maybe one out of a hundred. It's men killing men. These are the crimes. Violent crimes, you know, murder, men wars. Who are fighting the wars? The men, you know, now they start in America, they're bringing women up there too, getting killed, right? But still, generally it's men going out and killing men. Some women and children do get hurt in the process, but the most, mostly it's men. So there are all these factors which lead to a preponderance of women in any given society. So the allowance is there for men. It is not a rule in Islam. Every man should have four wives. Or at least two. No, <laughs> it's not saying it is a rule that you should have, but it is an allowance given to men to deal with this need. But it's to deal with the need according to a legal system, not a free for all, because this is what the man is probably proposing. You know, it's, yeah, it's good for men to have more than one woman, and then women should have more than one man. You know, it's like a free for all anything you want, anything goes. Freedom. This is what he's talking about, right? Whereas, you point out to him, look, in spite of the fact that it is allowed for Muslim men to have more than one wife, you go around the Muslim world. How many men do you find having more than one wife? If you told Americans, it is now legally okay for you to have more than one wife, man, <laughs> that would be it. I mean, people are doing it anyway, right? But it's not legal. Huh? But if you told them legally, it would be just like the Mormons, you got guys there who got 20 wives, 30 wives. But why? How? He's not working and supporting his 30 wives. His 30 wives are supporting him. He's like a pimp. You know, he's got all these women all working for him and turning their money over to him. And he, you know, he's living good. See, this is the idea of the free-for-all. Whereas in Islam, what we're saying is that that man, when he takes another woman, he is going to provide, protect, and maintain that woman. So it means economics. So he is not going to go into a situation if he cannot afford it and handle it. So that's why wherever you go around the Muslim world, though we are allowed to do it and others are not, you don't find more than 10 to 15 percent of any society, even here where people have got lots of money, no more than 10 to 15 percent who have more than one wife. So you see, this is an allowance made set by Allah to deal with a circumstance, a need. Whereas, what they're talking about, as we said, is a free-for-all. And not only that, but when we consider uh, marriage in Islam, what it does is it protects the rights of women and children. Right? Because when you have, because as we said, though in America they're saying polygamy, uh, sorry, monogamy is the rule in the Philippines, it is prohibited for a non-Muslim, because they've made allowance for Muslims to do it, right? So you even find some Christians who will say, I'm a Muslim, so he can do it, right? <laughs> yeah. But, I mean, and that's, that's their problem. I mean, we can't, you know, that, it's not going to change the law for us, right? But the point is that in these societies where they say, monogamy is the rule. You look at these guys. They have how many in, 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 um, in, in Philippines is they're called live-in, right? You know, how many wives who they're dealing with, who they live with, and so and so, you know? Unofficial wives, you know? And in America, you know, their girlfriends and mistresses and how many, how many people remain with that one woman? Jimmy Swaggart. I don't know if you remember, you saw the, the film Jimmy Swaggart between, the debate between Swaggart and um, Didat, right? How in the beginning of it, you know, he was sort of lauding over Didat. You know, you all can have like four wives and you know, we have to choose the best one. We only have one, we got to choose the best one, the first choice. And next thing we know, they photographed him with a prostitute going into a whorehouse. Jimmy Swagger. So much for your one wife. Even after he repented and cried and begged the people's forgiveness and they reinstated him, a year later, caught him again. Yes, he was caught a second time. Now he has given up totally. He's turned it over to his son. Finish. Yes, caught him again. Poor Jimmy. You know, but this is the reality. This is the reality of monogamy. You know? And well, as I said, it protects the right of the woman. One, in that she's the one who gets pregnant, who ends up having to deal with the problems of pregnancy, raising the children, etc. And two, it protects the right of the child. And it's the right of every child 
to know who his father is and to be looked after by that father. It's his right. Now when you say to a woman, you can have four husbands and she has a child, what does she do? How does she find out who is the husband? She says, eeny, meeny, miny, mo. <laughs> say, okay, you're the husband. <laughs> you're the father of this child. Nobody's going to be satisfied with that. You know? A child will want to know who is my father. If you're, and you're denying the child that right when you do it. And what you're doing in fact, if a woman takes more than one husband, she is now exasperating the problem. The problem which was that there are too many women, not enough men. She now is taking four men out of circulation. So it's just increasing the problem of the society. So on a logical basis, you know, we see that uh, limiting polygamy to men makes sense. Yeah, by agreement, I'm saying, but this kind of agreement is... You know, it is, uh, you know, agreement we say that the first child will be to you, the second one will be to you, but that is not going to satisfy that child. No, even genetic means, genetic means can only tell you that this couldn't be the father, but it could tell you the other three could be. Yeah, you know, so it is no definite uh, way, you know, and also when you consider in terms of um, uh, sexual needs, right? If a man has four wives, one wife is on her period or she's pregnant to a point where she's going to deliver or after pregnancy he cannot have sexual relations with her he still has three more that he can go to if a woman now has four husbands and she comes on her period finish all four of them now have to sit back and wait <laughs> and what's going to happen when you tell a man you know you know, <laughs> you know then you're just going to increase the corruption because he's going to go look for somebody else <laughs> okay Okay, are there any other uh, comments or questions? Okay, then we will close up. Subhanakallahum wa bihamdika. Nashadu wa la ilaha la ant. Nastaghfiruka wa natubu ilayk. We ask Allah to help us to realize the meaning of la ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. To realize it from a point of knowledge. And to internalize it in our hearts. And to act on it whenever action is required. We ask his tawfiq, his, his uh, help, his aid, his, the success which comes from him to be able to live as Allah has prescribed for us according to the declaration of faith. Amen. <laughs>